everyone. Welcome to worship today. I hope all of you are doing really well. Today's service is slightly different because it is a service of the word taken from the Scottish Episcopal Church, which is the church I attended when I lived in Scotland for four years. As usual, I will put up the words of the liturgy on the screen if you can please say the words in the bold print with me. I also invite you that if you have any prayer concerns, to please go to your grapevine and contact the prayer ministries that are available for you. They are all explained in the grapevine. In a second, I will put up a slide that has the readings for today. If you find it helpful, please take a moment to pause the video and bookmark the readings in your Bible. We enter into worship this morning by singing our first hymn, which is led by Kobe on the organ. begins with our opening prayer. Even though we are apart, we are still gathered together as the family of God to offer praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world, to ask forgiveness of our sins, and to seek God's grace, that through Jesus Christ our Lord and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we may give ourselves to God's service. We join together in the Collect for today, the fourth Sunday after Pentecost. Almighty God, you have taught us through your Son that love fulfills the law. May we love you with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. And may we love our neighbor as ourselves. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We will now turn to Patrick and Sharon, who will lead us in our first song of worship.
In preparation to hear God's word, we pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of your holy word. May it be a lantern to our feet, a light upon our paths, and a strength to our lives. Take us and use us to love and serve all people in the power of the Holy Spirit, and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first reading is from the book of Genesis. A reading from the book of Genesis, beginning in the 22nd chapter with the first verse. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and his son Isaac. And he cut wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to the young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood and the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And then he took his, in his hand the fire and the knife. And so they went to, together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father! And he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they, so they went both together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and then laid him on the earth altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from the heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram, caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm this morning is Psalm number 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death. And my enemy will say, I have prevailed. My foes will rejoice, because I am shaken. But I trusted in your steadfast love, my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, because he has dealt bountifully with me. Our Gospel reading is from the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So everyone who acknowledges me before men I will also acknowledge before my Father, who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my Father, who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth, for I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set man against father, and daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves the father or the mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves the son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses it, his life for me will find it. Whoever receives you will receive me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. 
and the one who receives a prophet, because he is a prophet, will receive a prophet's reward. And, and one who receives a righteous person, because he is a righteous person, will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water, because he is a disciple, truly, I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, hello, friends, and thanks for joining with me as we reflect on our scripture readings for today. Uh, today, we've got some pretty powerful readings in our uh, gospel reading and in our reading from the Old Testament. Uh, and while I'm going to mention our gospel reading as we move forward through our reflection today, I'm going to be sticking mostly with our reading from the book of Genesis. So, with that, why don't we begin? I speak to you today in the name of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, our reading from the book of Genesis is, as I have said, some pretty stirring stuff. Uh, and because of that, it can evoke a number of reactions uh, from us. And maybe as you heard it read today, something stirred up in you as well. In fact, for a lot of people, I find as a priest, it's a jarring kind of narrative to hear. And because of that, it can be hard to focus on and to listen for uh, what there might be for us to take on and to consider in it. In that way, um, it shares something in common with another Old Testament text, uh, the book of Job. And I think that, in fact, it's a bit helpful for us to orient ourselves uh, to our reading this morning uh, by way of that identification, by way of that reflection. You see, both of those are narratives of testing uh, that flow, really, from the hopes and from the fears, from the, the pain, from the yearning of the people that find themselves in the middle of the experience. And, you know, just in, like in the story of Job, as we ponder and we reflect on our reading from Genesis this morning, what we're going to find is that this particular reading is not really about the people who are in it per se, and the clues to help us to understand that are everywhere in our reading. I mean, for example, Sarah doesn't really exist at all. Isaac, to some degree, might as well be a, an inanimate object. And even Abraham ends up with pretty much all of the personality and a good chunk of the humanity stripped out of him in the way in which it's told. So these tellings are the kind of tellings that are ultimately about larger principles, uh, larger principles that play out in the relationships that exist between the people that are involved in them. And it's the time of trial that kind of brings these to the surface for us to be able to, to reflect on it and to consider. Because of all these things I've just said then, what we're going to find as well is that this isn't a reading that ultimately is going to address a number of the things that might be stirred up in us when we hear it. So this morning, why don't we try to tease out what is at play in this powerful reading from the book of Genesis. Let's start by diving right into the heart of the telling itself and by reflecting on who Isaac really is. You know, what it is that we are to understand about him as we move through our reading. Now, the first thing and the big thing for us to realize about Isaac from the very get-go is that he is so much more than just a person. I mean, he is a person, of course, but he represents so much more than just his personal identity. It's not going too far, I don't think, to say that Isaac is the literal embodiment of the hope of Abraham that he is the answer to the prayer and to the pain of Sarah, and that he is the proof and he is the means 
of God's miraculous faithfulness to carry out his promises in the lives uh, to those who, uh, to whom he makes those promises. So it turns out when we stop and we let all of it sink in that there's actually really a whole lot riding on Isaac. Let me lay it out for you a little further. You may recall that at one point Abraham wasn't Abraham, he was Abram. God called to him and set him on a journey that was going to take up, well, the rest of his life. God spoke to Abraham and he said, I want you to leave the land of your tribe and I want you to set out for a place that's far away because I am going to work through you to create a very special kind of tribe. Uh, a special kind of people, in fact, through whom the world will find my blessing. And you are going to be at the very heart of its beginning. Now, Abraham chooses to trust in this promise, in, in this sort of vision that's laid out before him. Uh, he agrees, and so off he goes. But that's not the end of the contact between Abram and God. No. Periodically, he meets up with this same God as he's going along his way. And he receives a confirmation of these same promises that had been made to him. The promise gets built on, uh, built up over these exchanges and over time. And in fact, God even ends up changing Abram's name at one point as a sign pointing to this very covenant that has been built between the two of them. His name becomes Avraham, the father of peoples. All right, so far, so good, right? But at the same time, over that time, there's a tension that finds root and begins to grow, the results of which we see manifest in our reading today. It is something that is not really easy for us to capture uh, in our imaginations. Uh, those of us who live in this time and in this culture, it's hard for us to get our heads around. But one of the very greatest tragedies, one of the very greatest shames that can exist uh, in a biblical culture is for a family line to just die out. You know, for there to be no continuance, for there to be like no legacy. Um, it's not a great example, but consider this. Um, Consider a, a midlife crisis, you know, this, this fear that suddenly strikes you that maybe you're not going to accomplish that thing that you were supposed to or that you wanted to accomplish. Um, and in turn, that starts to gnaw at you and, and you begin to ask questions like, has my life been for nothing? And existential worries like that. The lack of a child, and in our case, specifically a son, begins to gnaw at Abraham even as he continues to obey God. At one point, he cries out to God, what is going to happen to me, he asks. I mean, is some slave that I own just going to be my heir, you know, to wipe out my name and to replace my name with his, you know, to, to pass on to his sons and his grandkids? I mean, I thought you promised me that, like, I, was going to be at the heart of this whole beginning and continuance. Now this tension, right, this, this anxiety, and to some degree this shame doesn't just belong to and apply to Abraham. They apply equally, though in a very different way, uh, to Sarah, because she, after all, has journeyed with Abraham uh, this whole way. And the whole time she has had to endure the mounting shame that would be associated particularly with her, with being seen as not being able to conceive a child. In fact, we know in our text, so desperate does Sarah become to accomplish the task of providing her husband with an heir, because that's exactly how it would have been seen, that she hooks him up with her servant girl. I mean, at least that way she could indirectly claim uh, to have fulfilled the obligation that she was honor bound to carry out for the family, for the legacy, for the promise, for the continuation. But you know, even the pregnancy and the childbirth of Sarah's servant girl doesn't free her from this crushing sense of burden. In fact, actually it goes the other way. 
seeing her servant girl give birth and then move into motherhood, uh, Sarah finds herself confronted with a constant reminder, or at least that's what it seems to her that it is, of what could be perceived and probably would have been perceived as her own personal deficiency. And so she starts to lash out. She lashes out in her pain. She delivers abuse to this servant girl and her child at one point, forcing Abram to drive them from the family home. And all the while, she keeps praying. She keeps hoping she's going to be given the gift of a child of her own. So it continues. Abraham and Sarah following the path that is set before them by God year after year after year after year, living with this tension, living with this uncertainty, and living with this combination of hope and of, uh, of anxiety, of yearning. Eventually, they get to the point where they've grown too old to bear children anymore, and so when God appears next and reminds them of his intention to fulfill his promise, the one that he had made so long ago, all they can do is laugh. I mean, literally, Abraham falls on his face. He's howling at God's promounce pronouncement. I mean, come on, you know, like get real. Take a look at us. And God's response to Abram and Sarah is kind of instructive, I think. God replies this way. He says, is anything too wonderful for the Lord? No, he continues, my covenant is going to continue. I am going to renew it, and I'm going to renew it with a son who's going to be born to you, even in the predicament you find yourselves in. And, you know, as a sign of God's purpose, his, his power, his, his faithfulness, and so that the child himself would actually become a testament to the reality of all of these things, God gives them a name by which they're going to have to call the boy. And this is a name that's going to be carried into the generations to come. Yitzhak, Isaac, he laughs, or son, man of laughter. So everything that I've mentioned here is what's at stake in our telling this morning, in our reading. That is what is at risk. This is not just about Isaac as a person. It's actually about Isaac as a symbol of, a repository for, if you will, the very hope of Abram, the one who has journeyed his lifelong in service to the God who has called him, the yearning of Sarah, the person who finds herself in a predicament she can't control and oppressed and bound by her circumstances and yet still hopes, and ultimately then the faithfulness of God to the promises he makes to people just like that, I would argue, just like you and me. All of this brings us to the Mount of Moriah. Now, Jesus teaches that we ought to be kind of careful about how we place value or meaning in things. You know, that we should work hard, we should strive to see and weigh the value of things relative to the value system of the kingdom of God. This, in fact, is something of what Jesus is getting at in our gospel reading today. Uh, what Jesus does is he warns that if the kingdom of God really has come near, well then one of the impacts that that is going to have is that a lot of our systems of value and a lot of our systems of priority are going to need to be reevaluated in light of this new reality, of this new way of being. And further, that this reorientation is going to be absolutely, absolutely uh, fundamental uh, in its depth. It's going to end up cutting all the way to the most basic of our self-identifications. I mean, even, for example, to what it might mean to say that we have a people group, that we have a tribe. It doesn't get more basic than that. Now, elsewhere in our gospel, Jesus puts it a, a different way to give you another spin on it. He says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, oftentimes we equate treasure you know, with stuff, but I mean, the reality here is that anything that we place value in is going to require a spiritual thoughtfulness. Even when it is what we perceive as the deepest and the most life-giving blessings of God. 
or things that we believe or perceive that we've received in response or answer to prayer. And Jesus is pretty clear about this. This is part of what it means to live as people of the promise of the kingdom of God. And so this then, at its core, is the test. Whether Abraham places his trust in God or in the blessings that he believes that God has offered him. And if you wanted to push it, perhaps owed him. See, that's the principle that is at work. The matter of whether or not those who follow God merge God and the things that we believe and, and that we hope that he can do for us with his own person and make them one thing. You know, and in fact, by doing that, to begin to confuse the one for the other, not really being able to see them as separate things, and so therefore to be able to assign different levels of value or spiritual and emotional investment in. And this confusion is a dangerous road for us to walk, uh, spiritually for a whole pile of reasons. Because no matter how it ends up looking in practice, at root it leads us inevitably to this losing sight of our God and of his calling for us because we have become so focused and invested in the chase for what we perceive as the blessings that if you pushed us to it, we might just have to admit we feel that he owes us. Now, in churches, this sometimes works out in a really kind of crass way um, with his, which, uh, with what is sometimes called uh, the prosperity gospel, something I'm sure many of you have heard of. It's a way of thinking about God that equates the degree of his presence and his favor in the lives of individual persons with what is perceived as evidence of his blessing in those lives, usually uh, around the areas of wealth and success and health and you know, so on. I mean, you can sum the idea up this way. The holy uh, are rich, and powerful and they should expect to keep getting rich and powerful. The perverse are poor and they are stomped on and they should expect for it to keep going that way. Uh, this is exactly in fact how it should be and it's by the will and the mandate of God. It is a uh, particularly perverse and pervasive belief system. Believe me, it is not new. Um, it is profoundly unhelpful of course and it is decidedly removed from the gospel of the God who tells Mary that the lofty are going to be humbled in this kingdom and the low are going to be brought up. So it doesn't really bear a lot of thinking about actually. But here is the thing. You know, the temptation to confuse the blessing of God with what we perceive as the experience of his blessing, it doesn't have to take such a, a ridiculous and overblown kind of form in our lives or in our churches uh, to become a real spiritual problem for us. Because you see, no matter what form it takes, the movement at the root of it always ends up being the same, doesn't it? We begin to associate what we understand and believe about God's faithfulness, about his presence, about his love, his power, his mercy, his leading, only with the experiences of feeling as though we are indeed being blessed uh, with those things and in those ways. I mean, there are, as you can imagine, uh, a whole host of difficulties that follow such a, a spiritual commitment. I mean, as a consequence, we can begin to feel that God doesn't exist, or he's pulled away the second that we start feeling down, or we start feeling done in by. You know, that he is perhaps at best indifferent to human suffering, as we encounter and we wrestle with the pervasiveness of injustice and, and, and human sinfulness towards one another. You know, that maybe we've been abandoned if it feels like our prayers just go nowhere. You know, if we didn't get that thing that we were hoping for. If someone that we loved didn't get healed. If we lost our job or our health, uh, our marriage, or we struggle in relationship. You know, if we feel like we are stuck at home right now, and the world really seems kind of messed up in a lot of ways, and it feels like it's too big for us, and it's probably not going to end. See, friends, this stuff is real. 
This stuff can be really hard. And this stuff can really affect and trap a whole lot of people. We see it in action in the narrative of Abraham and of Sarah. It's in the tinge of yearning and anxiety, as well as made manifest in their efforts to try to bring about God's promises on their own and in their own terms. Let's wrap up. My sisters, my brothers, the story of Abram's testing of the journey up with Isaac to Mount Moriah, with all of its difficulties, still invites us to pay heed to a particular spiritual challenge that we can expect to run into as we follow the God who still makes his promises, even in our lives and in our times. And you know, the encouragement here for us is, is not that we ought to dismiss or denigrate the blessings of God or, or even our yearning for them, our desire to see them accomplished in this world. Now, living with the vision of God's kingdom and its promises in our very eyes is not a bad thing. In fact, it's one of the things that helps us to choose every day to try again to be the person that God calls us to be in the places that we find ourselves standing in. And it's the way that Jesus asks us to live. So, rather, the encouragement that we received this morning is that we would be honest and that we would be reflectful about what drives us in our attachments to and our yearning for the experience of God's blessing. And indeed, that we would even be reflective and spiritually thoughtful about the question of what we perceive to be the experience of the blessings of God. Because you see, in that way, we find ourselves better able to honor the blessings of God and to give thanks for them appropriately in relationship to the God who is in fact the giver of these gifts and by those experiences grow closer in relationship to him. And again, in that way, we might also be better able to stand in that place where whether the day greets us fair or not, we would find the grace to hope in the very faithfulness of our God who promises to be with us even until the end of our age. Amen. Let us affirm our faith with the words of Philippians 2. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. The divine nature was his from the first, yet he did not grasp at equality with God. He emptied himself and became like a slave, taking the nature of man. He was revealed in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient, even to death, death on a cross. Therefore God has raised him on high and has given him a name above every other name, so that in the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven, on earth, and in the depths, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. We now sing our second hymn this morning.
We now enter into a time of prayer. Cynthia will be leading our litany for us today. If you find yourself needing to take time for personal prayer, please pause the video and rejoin us when you feel ready. Let us pray. Let us pray for Christ's Holy Catholic Church. Let us pray for peace on earth and for the unity of all Christian people. Let us pray for our missionaries at home and abroad. Let us remember before God those of our brethren who have departed this life and are at rest. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ's church, militant here in earth. Almighty and ever-living God, who by thy holy apostle has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all people, we humbly beseech thee most mercifully to accept our alms and oblations and to receive these our prayers which we offer unto thy divine majesty beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all they that do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. For the worldwide church, we pray for the United Church of North India, Prem Chan Singh, moderator of CNI and Bishop of Jabalpur. In the Diocese of Bue, Burundi, we pray for the clergy who are in further education in the US. We beseech thee also to lead all nations in the way of righteousness, and so to guide and direct their governors and rulers, that thy people may enjoy the blessings of freedom and peace. And grant unto thy servant Elizabeth, our Queen, and to all that are put in authority under her, that they may truly and impartially administer justice to the maintenance of thy true religion and virtue. As a special intention, let us bring before God the systemic racism that exists in North America and throughout the world. Responding to the bidding, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Hear our prayer. prayer. For the end of violence perpetuated by harsh words, deadly weapons, or cold indifference, may our homes, our nations, and countries around the world become havens of peace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the grace to see every human being as a child of God, regardless of race, language, or culture. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the wisdom to receive the stories and experiences of those different from us and to respond with respect. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear Lord. our prayer. For the strength to teach our children how to resolve differences non-violently and respectfully and the courage to model it in our own behavior. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear Lord. our prayer. For our faith community, that we may celebrate 
and welcome the diverse faces of Christ in our worship, our ministries, and our leaders. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our faith community, that we may respond boldly to the Holy Spirit's call to act together to end violence and racism. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear Lord. our prayer. For healing and justice for all those who have experienced violence and racism. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For the protection of all police and first responders who risk their lives daily to ensure our safety. For fair and just policing that will promote peace and well-being in all our neighborhoods. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord, hear Lord. our prayer. For our public officials, that they will strive to work for fair education, adequate housing, and equal opportunities for employment for all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear Lord. our prayer. For our parish, that we may cultivate welcome, extend hospitality, and encourage the participant, participation of people of all cultures, ethnicities, and backgrounds. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the courage to have difficult conversations about racism and for better appreciation of how our words and actions or even our silence can impact our communities. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For solidarity in our global human family that we may work together to protect those who are most vulnerable and most in need. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops, priests, and deacons, especially thy servant Jane, our bishop, that they may both by their life and doctrine set forth thy true and living word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. For the Canadian Church, we pray for the Diocese of New Westminster, Melissa Skelton, Archbishop and Metropolitan of the Ecclesiastical Province of BC and Yukon. In our diocese, we pray for St. John the Evangelist Cold Lake, Donna Gautier, priest in charge, William Patterson, and Doug Giles, honorary assistants. We also pray for all First Nations people of Treaty 6. Prosper, we pray thee, all those who proclaim the gospel of thy kingdom among the nations, especially Anne and Sam Biro, Greg and Angela Thompson. And to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation at St. John's, that with meek heart and due reverence they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. For our parish, we pray for all the families, 
in particular the Thompson family, who are busily working on creating the videos for Vacation Bible Camp. Give them your energy and creativity. Cover their homes with your peace. We ask that you would guide this work, that the video content would be a clear expression of your love and compassion for all creation. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all them who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, especially those for whom our prayers are desired. For those who need healing, we pray for Michael, Paddy and family, Clarence and Donna, Ainsley, Lloyd, Carly, Leslie, the Armstrong family, Florence and Dexter, Lois, Robert, Jane, Hilary, the Colwell and Schillerbear family, Jim and Elaine, Y, Kim and Camille, Brenda, Donna, Cliff, Malaine, Samuel and family, Alma, Allison, Bob, Susan, Cheryl, Moritz, Dion, Christine, Allison, Jane, Simon, Mike, Elsie, Maria, Diane, Gertrude, Charity, Pat, Sheila, Jill, Floy, Hodan, Jan and Eric, Georgina, Wani, Kara, Thomas, Will, Patricia, Rita, Jolene, Peter, Aggie, Ian, Trish, Bonnie and Callista. And for our parish mission, we give thanks for the ministry and leadership of Alan Chettle through the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship at the U of A. And we also pray for the ministry of Young Life. And for the bereaved, we pray for Richard, Shelley and their family as they mourn the loss of Richard's father, David. We remember before thee, O Lord, all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear. And we bless thy holy name for all who in life and death have glorified thee, beseeching thee to give us grace that rejoicing in their fellowship, we may follow their good examples and with them be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant this, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honour and glory, world without end. Amen. Our service continues with the traditional form of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We now join together in our final song of worship. I raise
praise our hallelujah in the presence of my enemies I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah concludes with the words of the doxology, which will be followed by the grace. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you so much for joining with us in worship today. We hope you have a wonderful week ahead. And we now turn to Kobe, who will be playing our organ postlude. <laughs>